Hello, everyone. I'm your host today, Laura Greiner. And with me today, I have Matthias Costa, who is an assistant professor at Western College of Vet Med in Canada. Matthias, how are you today? I'm good. Thanks for the invite, Laura. Yeah, well, we're glad to have you on Swine It today. Matthias, for our audience, would you mind maybe giving a little bit of background about who you are and, and where you come from? Absolutely. I, I guess I'm not your regular swine vet. I definitely had zero agriculture background before joining vet school. So I, I'm Brazilian. I did vet school in Brazil. And when I joined vet school, I really wanted to work with wildlife. <laughs> so the first, the first year or so, I worked hard into going to zoos and trying to get internships. And uh, I, I realized that that was not something that, you know, would actually get me uh, the career I wanted. And, and the livestock industry, uh, is essentially, uh, it was actually through an internship at University of Minnesota with Dr. Simone Oliveira back in the day. Uh, I think I was one of her last students and she kind of got me hooked into the swine industry and I just could not stop working anymore since then. So, yeah, so I had, you know, no farms in the family. No one else was a vet. We didn't even have a dog or anything growing up. I had to like, I really asked my parents for a dog for a good 10 years. And then eventually I got a dog. So it is really unconventional, although I, I knew I wanted to be a veterinarian. So, yeah. And then I got into vet school, luckily. Not sure why they accepted me, but they did. And then it's, it's been kind of a funny journey since then. I, um, did my vet degree in Brazil. I went to Minnesota during my, my training to get uh, some research experience. And then uh, I was actually supposed to go back to Minnesota, but Simone left the university. So I ended up coming to Canada because it was the only colder place in Minnesota I could find. So it seemed like a good idea. But th here's a tricky thing, though. At the website uh, here at the University, of, the university of Saskatchewan, they say that Saskatoon has the most hours of sunlight through the year. No one tells you, though, that that does not correlate with temperature. So as a naive Brazilian, I was very excited to come to a sunny place. And I realized that at minus 40 degrees outside, it's still sunny. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so I came here, did my PhD uh, with Dr. John Harding, um, and, and then moved on to the Netherlands for a year, where I had a great experience in learning how the industry works there. Uh, very different disease challenge, very different industry overall. Although we think everything is standardized nowadays, it's it's not when it comes to agriculture. Uh, complete different climate. I was very happy to leave the cold behind me. <laughs> but then I actually uh, ended up coming back to North America. And, uh, and here I am after a few years, um, <laughs> back in the cold of Saskatchewan. <laughs> So that's, that's essentially it in a nutshell. <laughs> perfect. That's perfect. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a little bit different climate than maybe what you grew up with in Canada. <laughs> it is. And it's one of those things that um, you, you, never, you don't plan those things in your life. You don't realize you're going to do this and you kind of adapt as you go. So for anyone who lived north and moved south or lived south and moved north, adapting is a huge thing, right? We're, we, it's not normal for me to shovel snow. Like having a snow blower makes no sense. I never thought I would have a snow blower and feel like I need this thing. You know, I warming up your car, like going to the grocery store and leaving your car on because it's minus 40 and your battery can die. Plugging in your car. I mean, now we have electric cars, but before that, it, it's it's one of those things that, you know, it's uh, there. It was a life changing experience. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and it's interesting to your story about not having experience around animals, but yet being passionate about veterinary medicine. And I think that's that's a really unique story and, and how you moved into the swine industry along with it. And so one of the things I think we want to talk about today is really, you know, what you're doing today, because I think you're doing some really interesting work around swine and some of the swine pathogens. So can you maybe walk us through a little bit about what your work currently encompasses? For sure. So the way I like to um, <laughs> exploit my position, because I'm in a very privileged position where I, you know, collaborate with the industry. At the same time, I have the tools of academia. So the way I see is one of the biggest challenges we have as an industry, and we're already facing it, uh, is antimicrobial resistance, right? 
if you, I can guarantee you everyone in, in any barn anywhere in the globe at one point has to use antimicrobials. But guess what? We're so busy with the COVID pandemic that we didn't realize that we have entered the post-antibiotic era, right? We, we are already there. We are in an antimicrobial resistance pandemic. To give you an idea, there was a survey in 2013, and that's almost 10 years ago. That survey, uh, it was done here in Canada, but the data that made us realize that approximately 70% of our antimicrobial treatments failed at the first antibiotic choice. We had to use more than one drug to treat those animals. Isn't that alarming that 70% of your treatments failed? If this was a human, it, you know, you would be, a lot of people would be dying and that would not be a fun thing to do. So when we, when we realized that, that we were failing to treat our animals and they were not recovering, it's not just a huge financial impact. It's obviously a welfare issue as well. So what should we be doing differently? That, that's really what triggered me. And what are those challenges? And one of the challenges we have, or not one of the challenges, but the main issue is there is a list of swine diseases that we cannot do anything other than do antibiotics to treat those animals or even prevent. There's biosecurity, you know, there is, uh, you're trying to keep it away. But once you have it, there, there's no vaccine, there's nothing else. We need to get antibiotics in the, in the game. And that's what triggered me is that in our lifetime, we will go to the hospital at one point and our antimicrobial treatment will fail. And it's our social responsibility, you know, as an industry, as veterinarians, as producers, as researchers to prevent obviously our generation and the next generation from going through this pandemic or now we're going through it, but at least having better tools to fight it. So my research really is focused that what can we do differently to deal with this disease to which antimicrobials are the only tool we have to prevent, control, and treat pigs? And when you think about it, you know, we do have a lot of great vaccines. We do have a lot of great treatments that we can, uh, we've been using in the industry, but some of the most impactful disease, such as streptococcus suis, so strep meningitis, you know, there's nothing we can do. We can't vaccinate pigs for that. And we rely on antimicrobials. And it's, it's something that I'm hoping that through research and the next five, 10 years, we're going to have another tool where we don't need to rely so heavily on microbials. So my research has been focusing on that lately. So strep suis is one of these. Um, strep zoopidemicus is kind of a, a new pathogen that sprung into us a couple of years ago, caught me off guard as well. Uh, it really looks like African swine fever, and we were very scared when we started seeing the disease, and then we realized, oh, that's actually strep zoo is different. <laughs> this is not African swine fever, first of all, but it's still scary because of the mortality rates and how challenging it is to uh, get control of the pathogen and eventually get rid of it. And then the last one that I have a particular interest in is uh, swine dysentery, so the Brachys virus. Braxpira hyalux, Centeriae, Hampsonii, uh, Plos coli. Those are all diseases that if you ever dealt with them, you know they are annoying because they don't just go away. You're constantly dealing with them. And antibiotics is what you're using to suppress the clinical signs, right? So my research has been focusing on that and hopefully it will, I'll be able to keep focusing on that in the future so that something um, meaningful and useful for the industry will come out of this. So when you say you're working on that type of research now, are you working on trying to identify new antimicrobials that, that we can use, or are you trying to do some type of gene targeting, or what exactly are you doing now to explore this? Good question. So a combination of those. I realized that just like your financial investments should be diversified, your research investments should be diversified. So we're, I, I like looking at it from a, as, a, as a holistic approach as possible. So from dietary interventions, right? So diarrheic disease, they often somehow the pathogens deal with the microbiota. So can we leverage that? Can we leverage that to control disease? Or can we le even leverage that as a, you know, kind of a vaccine booster, right? Use the microbiota to improve vaccine efficiency. So that's one thing. Uh, I also work uh, as, I also investigate new antimicrobials. So um, we, are, we just have one um, candidate compound that we're evaluating right now that seems to be promising. 
So it's, it's, and then obviously I'll new vaccine targets as well. So I really think that, you know, nowadays science is collaboration. I don't know that much to do anything alone anyway. I don't try to pretend. So, but when you collaborate with great minds, you, you can do very fun stuff and you can get very interesting data. So instead of focusing on one single approach, I feel like, you know, no one's going to, no one thinks that in 10 years, you're going to have one single answer to your problems, right? But with the MR problem, I think we're going to have to use a combination. It's going to be a non-antibiotic treatment. It's going to be increasing some certain amino acids in the diet when you have, you know, diarrhea, or is it going to be a new vaccine that we can use, but, you know, you also need to do something else to prevent those pigs from breaking with diarrhea at, at, you know, at weaning. So it, it's going to be a combination of measures, but I think we'll have enough tools that, you know, as you were saying, like you worked in a, in a antibiotic free production system, we can do it, right? It's been shown that we can do it. But the question is, what do we do with those animals that need treatment? Do we need to jump the gun and use antimicrobials or can we still use other approaches so that we mitigate that? And antimicrobials, even the ones there, we, we would think they're not uh, medically important, they really become our last, our, you know, our last resource or our, our last thing to try, the last thing on the list. And we have other things we can do because resistance is a problem and it's not going to go away anytime soon. One of the things that I used to spend quite a bit of time on was looking at, at organisms. I worked with um, homophilus influ parainfluenza for children. And so we looked a lot at the host and the interaction with the organism, particularly because it was commensal and, and all of a sudden then would become pathogenic. And so you had mentioned strep suis or glossers or whatever people want to identify it as today as being one of those organisms. And I think about that one a lot because we talk about that happening many times at the sow farm where the piglets are getting exposed, but we don't really see it presenting itself per se until the nursery. So what are you seeing in terms of, of your research in terms of the host and the pathogen and how they interact with one another? For sure, great question. So yes, those pathogens are a challenge, right? Well, they're, let's put it this way, as you said, they're not even pathogens, right? They're bacteria that 100% of the pigs have strep suis, right? You cannot find a pig without strep suis. One thing we've learned that I thought was surprising is that uh, strep suis is the majority of the bacteria in the eyes of pigs. And it, we were looking at something completely different and it's kind of sprung onto us, like, why is there so much strep suis on the eye and, you know, and not just, you know, we always thought about it as a tonsil upper respiratory tract. It's also in the eye. It's everywhere. They get colonized when they are born. And we need to understand what triggers that disease, right? What triggers that horrible presentation that we see? And, and once they invade the host, so once they break into any of the barriers, they gain access to the brain. And if, when you think about it from, as an immunologist, when you think about it from an immunological perspective, gaining access to the brain is quite a feature. Not everything can do it, right? It's a challenge. So the host pathogen interactions, I think we've always been looking at it from a simplistic perspective. There is no such thing as host pathogen interactions. There is a third member there. So it's always a host microbiota pathogen interaction. There is a, a lot of things playing uh, in this field all the time. And we've been neglecting probably one of the major players. The, and it's challenging though, because we're literally just scratching the surface with microbiome research. We, even the tools we have, and I, I, I'm sorry to break the news for people who are not uh, looking into how we generate the data. Every time we generate microbiota data, it's biased. There is no way we can do it so far that it's completely unbiased and show us the real picture. Uh, good data relies on a lot of controls and it's very expensive. So what we think we understand about the microbiota is still a bit, you know, not wrong, but it's still a bit biased. It's not exactly what it is. And also 90% of the research done only looks at what we should be calling the bacteriome. We're not looking at the virome. We're not looking at the fungal, right? It's, and it's, a, it's sure 90% of the microbiota is bacteria. But that 10% plays a role and plays a very important role, actually. 
So when we think about host microbiota interaction, it really is one of the biggest challenges, but also one of the biggest opportunities to deal with this commensals, right? Because once we realize we can actually prevent this uh, commensals from turning to pathogens by suppressing a specific pathway or suppressing some kind of trigger, that will be life-changing, not just for the pigs and for human uh, medicine as well. So I'm going to give you an example of how we're trying to understand that better. Brachyspire is probably one of the most fascinating pathogens I've ever had the pleasure to learn about. I'll tell you why. So Brachyspire, when we say Brachyspire, people immediately probably think about Brachyspire hyacinthiae, right? Swine the century. There's Brachyspire Peloscoli and some other Brachyspira. Uh, Peloscoli is unique, and Peloscoli is unique because it actually touches this, the host. So Peloscoli will go on to attach to the host and cause disease. And Peloscoli is also zoonotic. So let's put Peloscoli away for a bit and go back to Hyacinthia because that's the one important for swine. That's the most um, aggressive and scary disease, right? Swine dysentery. Brachyspire hyacinthia does not touch the pig. It will swim very closely to it. It will, you know, it goes into the colon, it go, breaks the mucus barrier of the colon, but it never actually touches or invades the pig. All that damage, and I don't know if you've ever had an opportunity to see the colon of a, a pig with swine the century. It's angry and it's it looks bad, right? It's blood, it's necrosis, it's fibrin, you know, it's red and yellow and everything at the same time. So all that damage is likely driven by the microbiota. Bragaspar is not really the one, you know, it may trigger some of the damage, but what we're learning is that there is more to that equation because we've been thought to think about, uh, there's such a thing in, in infectious disease called cost postulate, right? Cost postulate was actually postulated uh, decades ago. And the idea is that you have one pathogen, one disease. If you put this pathogen into a host, it's susceptible, it will cause disease and you should be able to recover this pathogen. We're learning that things are not that simple, right? With the microbiota and as we progress, uh, as science progresses, we're learning that disease such as swine dysentery, it's not just having the pathogen because 100% of the pigs have brachyspira. So brachyspira, not brachyspira, have dysentery. <laughs> so that's very important to make it clear. But 100% of the pigs, every time we look at colon samples and we sequence it, we find brachyspire. So finding brachyspire hives interior though does not also mean you have disease. We have tested multiple pigs. They are positive by culture. So we can grow brachyspire hives interior. They don't have swine dysentery and they never been exposed before. So it's not like they have immunity to it. So there is more than what we think there is when it comes to infectious disease. And Brachyspire is a good model because we understand enough about it. And the intestine is, is somewhat, uh, it's, it's pretty different from the lungs and the tonsils from the perspective that there's a lot of bacteria in there. So the microbiome is, very, is a very large population of cells. So it's kind of a good model to understand that when I say, you know, disease is not just pathogen bacteria, sorry, pathogen, the host and the environment, it's pathogen, the host, the microbiota and the environment. And what we're learning now with Brachyspire is exactly that. There seems to be a specific microbiome type or a specific players there that without them, Brachyspire doesn't do much. You know, you can have, pigs will have transient diarrhea, loose stools, but not bloody diarrhea that, you know, we are, uh, we're used to seeing in a full-blown outbreak. So, and that's what I mean. Like there is, uh, there's so many different approaches we have to take to develop these alternatives. And, you know, microbiota modulation is one of those. The problem is, is the science there yet to the point that we can deliver a product? So probably not. It will take us a few more years until we understand things well enough to, buy, to be able to deliver such a product, but we're definitely on track for that. So, you know, Braggaspar is a good example for that. Strep suez is a bit different because as you, I just told you, you pigs have strep suez everywhere. So their eyes is full of strep suez, their throats are full of strep suez if they make it to the lungs. And guess what? We also found strep suez in the intestine. So, you know, it, it goes everywhere. Whenever there is a breach, it will go in, right? So understanding the interactions with, between strep suez and the pigs is a bit more complicated just because I, the way I like to teach strep suez to the student is if you ever watch Rambo, the 1980s movie, which is a, a horrible example, it's war, 
and, and people shooting. But the funny thing I always found about Rambo is that he always had one weapon. He would like keep taking weapons out and he was never out of weapons. And there's even that uh, a movie by Charlie Sheen that was kind of making fun of, of Rambo, right? That's exactly what he kept doing. He just never ran out of any kind of weapon. And But, you know, as fun as it sounds, Strap Suez is exactly that. It has hundreds of weapons. So when we try to develop a vaccine for Strap Suez, we can't because you vaccinate for something and he pulls another one and you vaccinate for that and he pulls another one and you give it antibiotics and he has another one. So Strap Suez is way more challenging from that perspective than Brachyspire because it, it has so many different ways of causing disease. It's not a single virulence target. It's not a single toxin like some E. coli or, or APP sometimes. It's, it's way more complex. So it's it, the understanding the whole pathogen interactions for Strap Suez, it's, it's not something that will be done in five or 10 years. You know, uh, Dr. Marcelo Goldschalk has been looking at it for 30 years since, since before I even thought about vet school. And, you know, you talk to him about it and it's, there's so much that we don't understand. So it's, it's, it, it requires, um, you know, a collab collaborative effort to understand that. And, you know, unfortunately, Strap Suez is not COVID that we're going to have a huge dump of money and human resources into investigating that. So we tend to move a little bit slower than, than COVID moved forward. But I think we'll eventually get there for Strap Suez and Brachyspira and, and those other diseases. It's just going to take a little longer. One of the things I found interesting when I was working on Haemophilus was the organism actually had the ability to make a biofilm inside the ear or the lung, whatever we were looking at. And so there was a lot of speculation at that time, and, and it's been proven now is that when they have that biofilm, right, they have that protective coating and, and the body's not going to attack it, but they have this really unique ability to let antibiotics in or the antimicrobials in. And so those bacteria in the inside can spend some time there, right? And you start selecting for those organisms that can survive that infiltration of the antimicrobial. So when the biofilm ruptures, now I have that resistance, right? So is that something we see with some of these organisms as well? Or do you believe it's more straight what's coexisting with them? I think biofilm is definitely one of the biggest challenges, exactly the way you described it. For those organisms, though, as surprising as it may sound, I don't think biofilm is the key factor. Brachyspira definitely is unable to, to create biofilm. It may, and this is a funny thing. Biofilm is not something, um, let's put it this way. It, it, bacteria do not segregate bacteria. They, you know, there is no prejudice. There is no, um, because I'm a type of bacteria, I'm not going to hang out with you. There is no such thing. So biofilms are very inclusive to the point that we find multiple different bacteria in the same biofilm created by one specific type. So Brachyspire does not take advantage of that, mostly because it's motile, I believe. Uh, I don't have data to support that, but that would be my guess. It's, it's moving around. It doesn't need that. But Strapsuits may probably piggyback, <laughs> piggyback on that from the perspective that if there's someone else you know, breaking the door, Strapsuits will go in. And if, it, if biofilm is one of those uh, tools to break the door, Strapsuits definitely will take advantage of that. But honestly, it's there's so much at, at so many different interactions when we think about strep suis and disease and so many things we don't even think about that we don't understand and have not thought about it yet that I, I know I'll be guessing by telling you this is one of the key things or not because it's it's again it's it's so complex like I said it, it survives any and everywhere so yeah it probably does create a biofilm and probably does thrive in it is it important as a biofilm on the eye, I, I don't know. It could be. I, I don't see a reason why not to. But uh, it's definitely one of the challenges when it comes for environmental contamination. So strep suis, every pig has it. Strep epidemicus, not everyone has it, luckily, because if they all had it, um, you know, it's specifically there's a, a strain that's associated with disease, it would be much, much more challenging. So strep epidemicus is definitely taking advantage of biofilms, especially in the environment. We have had a lot of trouble trying to eradicate strep zoo, and it's because it, it does things that we didn't know it would do. 
So I'm going to give an example. So strabzolipidemic, because if you ever heard of strabzolipidemic before, it's associated with respiratory disease in multiple different species, specifically horses is, is a big deal uh, for equines uh, and horse owners because it, it could be associated with strangles. It's, it's, it's a big challenge. When it comes to pigs, though, we kind of thought it would act the same way, right? Oh, it must be a respiratory challenge or associated with lungs. Absolutely wrong. We had no idea what we were doing. We figured out that strep zoo is more of a, it could be in the tonsils. It definitely likes the tonsils, but it apparently is also an intestinal pathogen. It doesn't lead to diarrhea, but it can use the intestine to translocate into the host. And it's also shed in the feces. So, you know, when something is shed in the feces, it's going to go everywhere in a pig barn and it's probably going to survive in some kind of biofilm somewhere when you're washing things, right? So getting rid of it is a big challenge. So, you know, it, it's, it, we're, we're very fortunate because we have great minds in the swine industry and we are very unfortunate because we, would, we could really benefit from more minds and more people looking into these challenges. So hopefully in the, in the next, you know, five, 10 years here, we're going to be able to elucidate some of these issues a little bit more and you know have better answers but because i understand as a producer i'll be very frustrated dealing with something like that yeah yeah I, and i think that's really interesting we had a case study um where we were having a rotavirus c issue in the the farrowing house right so a viral issue and um tried many different things disinfection and and everything that we could think of and had a group come in and they they did more of a, a widespread kind of shotgun approach in our diagnostics. And they actually found that it was an E. coli that wasn't necessarily pathogenic, but was enough to change that microbiome, just like you were speaking of, where now all of a sudden we were presenting with rotavirus C, but that was not really the issue, right? So once we went in and changed the microflora, got rid of the E. coli issue, the rotavirus C went away. So how do we help our producers? Because that, and our veterinarians for that matter, because that's really frustrating. And it's very frustrating from our perspective too. <laughs> it's frustrating for everybody. I'm gonna tell you why it's frustrating from my perspective as a researcher. We're not there yet where the technologies we use to study the microbiome are crystal clear. We're trained as veterinarians and we are trained as producers that if you test for influenza, it's either positive or negative. You either have or you don't have it, right? So it, the microbiome doesn't work that way, unfortunately. You have it. There's no way. So, but what's in there, and, and I don't think what's in there is even that important anymore. A lot of the research in the past 10 years, so the microbiota research really started peaking in early 20, 2000s, you know, 2010 and 2020. We're, we still see a lot of research focusing at the question, who is there at the microbiota, right? Who is, who, who is there? What in, but we don't really ask the question, what are they doing yet? And that's partially because asking that question is literally more expensive and, and more challenging to answer. But I do believe that to help veterinarians and producers, we need to kind of stop thinking that it's important, you know, who is the bacteria? What, you know, it doesn't really matter if you have E. coli or whatever it is, there's so many bacteria. Like you have 10 to the 14th things in there. You have so many things. Naming them all is useless. What's important is what are they doing there? So, um, and, you know, we are starting to understand the importance of that. And there is a bit of a mindset change from the perspective of, you know, you can have brachiospiral hyalus interior without disease. That's okay. Uh, it's important to know what is it doing there, because if there is, for example, and I'm going to give you a, an actual example that seems to be proving itself um, with Brachyspira, is that there are specific uh, types of bacteria, or there are, there are specific uh, metabolites that are important for Brachyspira disease. So it doesn't matter who's generating that, those metabolites in the microbiota, if we stop them from doing that, Brachyspire won't cause the full-blown swine dysentery. So it, it's frustrating from a veterinarian and a, and, and a producer perspective because we don't have the tools to tell you, hey, it looks like we need to reduce the amount of fructose or inc increase, uh, I know, like, I don't, I'm not a nutritionist, but in, increase the amount of uh, 
I know, detergent, uh, neutral detergent fiber, whatever it is, and it will change the bacteria. But we will get there. We're starting to move towards that where it doesn't matter who you have. It, what it matters is what are they doing. And if we remove a piece from the puzzle and they stop doing that, and that helps you, for example, control the amount of this E. coli, and that's enough, right? So in the, I, I, that's where I see that we're going to be in the next five to 10 years. We're going to stop caring so much about getting a positive or negative result. Uh, obviously, some pathogens will still need it. Don't, 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 tell, don't start telling people that, oh, it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> I'm a nucleus and I have all these pathogens. No, it doesn't work that way. But for some of this disease, controlling it is going to be from the perspective of you, can, you have it, that's fine. As long as we keep it in check, I don't know, colonic pH, right? If that's all we need to do, acidifying water, and it, that will decrease pH, and hopefully that will suppress a given uh, production of a given sugar, and that stops disease from, from actually developing, right? Because at the end of the day, that's all that really matters. We're learning right now with COVID that I have COVID, you have COVID. It, Omicron does not let anyone get away, right? And it's the same thing with some of these diseases. Strep suicide, everybody has it. As long as we can keep it in check, is it a vaccine or is it something else? That's fine. You, we can survive with it and we'll move on with our lives. So I think that's where, where the, the industry will probably get going as we reduce and start removing antibiotics from, uh, from production and, uh, and a large scale is that some of these pathogens will control them without the need of antibiotics, but they're still going to be there. You know, you're going to be positive. And 20 years, 30 years in the future, someone's going to be like, what do you mean you didn't have it? Wow, how did you even manage not having it? I mean, everybody has it now. That's I can't even think of a world where not, you know, all bars in the world don't have this specific pathogen, but we don't have disease. So it doesn't matter if you test positive or negative anymore. So it's frustrating. It will be frustrating for the next few years until we are at the point that we know how to harness the power of the microbiome. We're starting to understand we don't have the best tools yet. We're getting there. So I guess my message is hang on there. Keep, keep learning about it. Um, there's definitely approaches that already work. We may not fully understand why, but there's definitely things that already work. But to, you know, the, the full-blown revolution will come. And unfortunately, I think it will come because of, it, of the antimicrobial resistance pandemic. It will, will be forced to figure it out, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you you summarized that perfectly because that was my next step was just to kind of summarize where you were going. But I think that that really did a nice job of summarizing kind of where you see we're headed and and how long and and what's going to be happening. So thank you for that. Um, so as we wrap up our time today, we like to ask our, our guest speaker just a couple of kind of different questions, if you will. The first one we like to ask is, what's your favorite swine resource book that you'd recommend to the audience? You know, that's a great question. And I'm probably going to disappoint a lot of people when I say I don't go to a favorite book and I don't have a favorite book. Um, what I have, I, and I think that's what everybody should be doing nowadays, is you don't need to limit yourself to a specific source. Is, you know, Google, Google Scholar, if you're not familiar with PubMed and you want to get into real science, is going to Google Scholar and looking for scientific articles on the subject you're interested in. Because nowadays it doesn't matter where things are published anymore, right? You, we have access to gigabytes or the whole library, the whole you know, the Congress libraries that is on, on your hand with your phone. So you need to find the information that you want. It doesn't matter what it is. So to be quite honest, I don't have a specific swine book I go to. I look for the information I need on this a huge amount of data we have available on our phones and computers. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, how about um, something that's not necessarily related to work? Are there any books that you'd recommend to the audience? <laughs> uh, yes, but unfortunately it's not. I, I, I may be wrong, actually. There's a book by a Brazilian writer that uh, I wrote as a, I wrote, I read as a teenager and I always go back to it. Um, and I, it's called Grande Sertão Veredas. So that means essentially there's a, a, a area in Brazil that is somewhat dry. It's called the Sertão. Um, it's kind of a savanna-ish like biome. And it essentially tells a story about this young man that it, he's trying to understand life 
and it's called it, Grande Sertão means kind of big prairies, big savanna, and veredas actually means small rivers. So it's the, the perspective that the big picture, how do we fit in the big picture as you know the small rivers we are? And, and that author just has some amazing insights. He wrote it in the 50s. And every time I go back, when you read some of those passages, you realize that things, it, it, they're atemporal, right? It doesn't matter when they were rolled, they still make sense today. And one of the things he mentioned is, you know, life sometimes it kind of like pushes you and pulls you and moves you around and shakes you, but it doesn't matter what it's doing. All it wants from you is courage, right? It's courage to uh, go, go to your next class. It's courage to try a new treatment. It's courage to get in the plane. It's courage to get out of your comfort zone, right? So if you, I, I'm happy to share uh, the actual spelling of that book. If anyone has interest, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was translating to English. I don't remember the title into English, but it's a it's a great book. And from the perspective, that it's, it's a story that, you know, it's it's much more about the philosophy of facing life than, you know, the reality itself. So I think that's an interesting reading. Mm -hmm. Very good. So that kind of leads into the next question. Um, when you think about someone who's successful in our industry, what trait stands out to you that you think's helped them be successful? I think it's that. It's courage to do something different. Um, people I've seen who are successful in the swine industry, they broke the cycle. You know, we've been doing this for 20 years. It's always been like this. Why would I change now? Well, because these are different times, right? So people who are successful decided to do things differently, decided not to do the, take the, the low hanging fruit and just do that. They decided to take a chance, you know, be brave. And if you fail, you fail. It's part of life. So I think that that is what I, people I look up to, that's what they all had in common. It's, it's courage. Perfect. Well, wonderful, Matthias. We thank you for your time today. Um, for our audience, again, this is Dr. Matthias Costa. Um, again, we want to thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity of having this chat. I was, I mean, looking forward to it after seeing so many episodes with great people and, you know, mm -hmm. great thoughts being shared. I was like, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm humbled to be invited to this. So thank you so much. That's been exciting. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Thank you. You too. Imagine if, with a few key concepts, you could have the potential to create a massive positive impact by bringing from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for swine producers. Join us on this small group and go to the next level of swine nutrition on this seven-week-long elite online training in applied swine nutrition and feeding by myself and my world-class invited speakers. Additionally, you enjoy an exclusive community to exchange ideas. Go now to www.eliteswinenutritionist.com.